Every sermon that you preach, it has to start in the Word of God. Amen. It can't be philosophy. It, it can't be what I think. It has to be what God thinks. Now, in Genesis chapter 14, something amazing happens after Abraham goes to battle and, and he has battle with the kings of Shadow and Moor. He comes back and he runs into this character, came Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, which that's where we get the word Jerusalem. That's where he was the king of. He was in Jerusalem. Brought forth bread and wine. This is Old Testament, but that's communion. What is communion? Bread and wine, right? So we have a, we have a king of Salem brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So we have a priesthood on the earth right now, in Genesis. Amen. Amen. I, I can read. Say we had a priesthood. And that's interesting that that priesthood was established from time and all eternity. And that priest blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Man, I tell you, if you ever want to read a scripture to get excited about God's plan for your life, I just read it to you. That God has a high priest after the order of Melchizedek that is functioning today. Now at this time, what was the, uh, what was the world operating under, grace or law? No, it wasn't. No, 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 no. No, no, no. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The law didn't come till Moses. The law didn't come till Moses. You give the, say with me, the law? It didn't come till Moses. The reason, the reason God operated with grace back here is so he wouldn't kill everybody. And even on grace, he had enough after all the craziness that went nuts on the world. And so the law did not come till Moses. And Noah found grace, not the law, in the eyes of the Lord. Hallelujah. What do we got next, guys? In Leviticus 17.11, we got this right. I, I transposed it on you guys. And God is now dealing with the law. Everybody say the law. So the law is now in motion. And here... God is telling Moses, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And so what God told Moses, it's a life for a life. So because we have sinned and fallen, God said, instead of killing you, I'll take an animal, I'll slay the animal. And instead of killing you, I'll, I'll kill the animal and substitute the animal's life and give you the life of the animal. And God said, a life for a life. And that's what the blood of an animal did for you. <laughs> My God, what would the blood of Jesus do for us? Wow. <laughs> what would the blood of Jesus do for us if that's what the blood of bulls and goats did? Wow. Oh, God, I thank you that you're faithful to your word. Okay, I think we have one more Hebrews. This is one of the most important scriptures in your Bible. Because this clearly identifies what happened in Israel, in the, the Feast of Israel... But Christ became, being come in high priest. I wonder who he's in high priest after. For good things to come. Everybody say good things to come. You know God has good things for you? Yes. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle. In fact, the book of Hebrews is called the book of better promises. There's Eleven promises in Hebrew that God says is possible because of what Christ has done. And he's in a tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. He said, he's in, he went to a tabernacle, but it wasn't made with hands. I wonder where that tabernacle is. Hallelujah. It's in heaven. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Ever say his own blood. He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. But I want to go back right here. Now, I believe the writer of the Hebrews is the Apostle Paul. Some say it's Apollos. I, I don't agree with that, but I, I believe it's Apostle Paul. And let's go to the next. I want the next verse. And look what he writes here. Notice what he writes. Neither by the blood of goats and calves or goats and bulls. <clears throat> How did he miss the lamb? How did he miss the lamb? Bible scholars. 
Who wrote this? I believe Apostle Paul did. Apostle Paul was taught in the study of the, of the Pentateuch. Apostle Paul sat at the feet of Gamil. He was one of the wisest men that knew the Word of God. That's why God chose him to describe the law and transfer it into the New Testament so we could understand grace and how they interposed each other and juxtaposed each other. But he forgets the, the Lamb. Well, why didn't he mention a lamb here? Jesus. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just asking you. Where, where, where's the lamb here? Mm -hmm. All right. I, I guess I, I, I'm trying to make you think. If you come to church here, I'll make you think. The Bible says study the Word of God, and that's my job to make you think to study. So... It's always been said, and guys, we'll get that tabernacle up there in a minute. It's always been said that blood, the secret about blood is it always returns to its source. Think about that. The blood in your body, it always returns to the heart, right? It always returns to where it gets life. So the secret about blood is it returns to its source. Leviticus tells us, we just read it, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And God said, I've done that, and I've transposed the life of the animal to you. And it's made an atonement for your souls. That's amazing. An animal could do that. The very famous Bible scholar Vincent Taylor, he noted that in Scripture, it refers to Christ's blood. It does nearly three times as often as it mentions the cross. It refers to the blood of Jesus Christ five times as often as it refers to the death of Christ. Therefore, the blood is absolutely the sacrificial element that indicates the all-encompassing redemptive work of Christ on the cross. Everybody say with me, it's the blood. It's the blood. Think about that. Three times more than the cross. Five times more than the death of Christ. In Genesis 9, excuse me, 4, 19 through 14, and you know this, it's the story of Cain and Abel, and Cain sl slays his brother Abel. And God makes a statement there that's incredible. And he says, your brother's blood crieth from the ground, right? And that's not what, quite what it says. It says, your brother's blood crieth unto me. Your brother's blood crieth unto me. It doesn't just cry from the ground, it cries unto God. That's interesting. The blood of a man cries unto God. And God hears it. Wow. I wonder what the blood of Jesus cries and what God hears there. And what's amazing is Abel's blood is shed for doing the right thing. Do you realize that? Do you know Jesus Christ's blood was shed for doing the right thing? And after Abel's blood cries unto God, God himself goes into action based on the blood of Abel crying unto him. That's amazing. God goes into action because Abel's blood has now cried out to God. And God says, I hear that cry. I hear the voice and the voice is crying vengeance. And what's amazing to me is God goes into action and he goes into vengeance on Cain. And he gives Cain a penalty worse than death. A cursed life. And he says, you're going to live with the iniquity of your actions all the days of your life. He says, you're going to live a tormented life. I imagine at this point, you know, the Bible says that Cain tells God, he said, I can't bear my punishment. That's what he tells God. He said, I can't bear this. In fact, Romans tells us, don't avenge yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Get for it is written, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now, don't, don't ever try to get vengeance on anybody. Give it to God and let God handle it. I'm telling you, the, the vengeance of God will blow your mind. And Paul, in fact, he says, as it is written. And what's he talking about? It's written in Deuteronomy where God said, vengeance is mine. So as a child of God, you need to understand, you don't need to avenge yourself ever. Let the hand of God take care of whatever your situation is. And I, I, I've got news for you. You cannot believe the vengeance of God on, on, on situations. Anybody ever seen the vengeance of God in your life? That where you just put it in his hands and let God go. I was stunned and have been stunned at that. Blood moves God to action. Say, blood moves God to action. You want to get God moving, get some blood on the scene. In fact, I'll tell you how powerful the blood is that 
if we confess the Lord Jesus Christ in his death and his burial and that Christ God raised him from the dead, boom! God writes your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Wow! Don't tell me God doesn't move by the power of blood. But in Hebrews, the writer says, not by the blood of bulls or goats, but by his own blood. He entered once. Everybody say once. once. This is really important. This is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hold it. Only the high priest can go into the holy of holies. How did Jesus take the right to steal the priesthood of Israel? God's not a usurper. He's not a thief. The devil, we clearly know, is, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The Aaronic priesthood was instituted at the hand of God himself. God came down and he gave Moses the exact blueprint of the tabernacle in heaven. And then he says, by the way, take Aaron. And he said, I'm going to clean him up from that mass of the golden calf. And I want you to make him a high priest unto me. And God said, I'm going to tell you what linen to put on him, what vestige to put on him. I'm going to give you the oracles. And God ordained the, this priesthood on the earth for 1,600 years. God ordained it. Men did not do this. God did this. And Jesus Christ comes down and now... He goes into heaven? Hold it. Where did Jesus get the right and the authority to take on the priesthood of Israel? I'm glad you're asked. Yes, he is God, but something happened. I'm going to talk about that today. Only the whole high, high, high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And God said, this is sacred and holy to me. So in Genesis 14, 19, we just read that, that... There was a priesthood on the earth. Blessed be the Abraham, the God of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be the Most High God, which delivereth thine enemies unto thine hand. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, or king of Jerusalem, brought forth bread and wine for... So Jesus has always been a priest. Your Bible says that he is prophet, priest, and king. He is prophet... Priest and king. Amen. Amen. So, in the fall of man, and in that situation, God said, I'm going to have to redeem this situation. But have you ever realized that without God's grace and your mercy, you can never hit the mark personally? Have you ever come to the conclusion yourself that you realize all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that includes me? Am I the only one in here that has ever come to that conclusion that knows, God, I'm a sinner and I need you? Am I the only one? I was showing because. So God says, I'll, I'll tell you what, there's going to be some priestly work that needs to be done. And the law was given to show man that man cannot achieve this in his own right. That you cannot work your way to heaven. You cannot do good enough things to get yourself to heaven. David says our righteousness is his filthy rags. And God said, I'm going to let the God describe to the whole world just for eternity that man cannot get back to God in relation to the gulf that we have between heaven and earth. Man cannot get himself back there. And the law proved that. So Melchizedek is operating in a time of grace and there's no law yet. So the Aaronic priesthood has existed 1,600 years, ordained by God, organized by God. I want to read something out of Leviticus 10. And this will set the record straight on those of you and those in Judaism that think that this isn't true. I'm just going to read God's word. Is that okay? So I am in Leviticus chapter 10. Guys, do I have some more light up here? Here we go. Hallelujah. <laughs> we did pay the light bill. And they have an Ab Abney, Ab Abney, Ab Ab Abihu. The sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense therein and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not to do. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Wow. Then Moses said unto Aaron, listen to, listen to this, this is unbelievable how stern this is. 
Moses said unto Aaron, This is that of the Lord. This is what the Lord spake. I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Aaron knew he was in trouble. Aaron knew they had disobeyed God. <laughs> and Moses called Mishnah and Aliphan, the sons of Tezrael, under the, of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry out your brethren from before the sanctuary out the camp. So they went near and carried them to, out of their courts into the camp. And then Moses continues, wow. And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eliezer, and unto Ithatar, thy his sons, Uncover not your heads. Don't take the mitres off your heads. Don't take your spiritual garments off. Do not take the covering off your heads, neither rend your garments, lest ye die. And lest with them come upon all the people. But let your brother and the whole house of Israel Beveil the burning of the Lord with the, that has been kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle for the congregation lest ye die. For the anointing of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. So they offer strange fire. God strikes them dead. And God tells Moses to tell Aaron, Don't rend your clothes. Don't rend your priestly garments. Because they had in Israel they had made a law later on. And they had added this to the law. It was made by the Pharisees. It was not made by God. And God told them you can never tear your clothes. Your priestly robes. How many have a robe of righteousness? Yes, amen. How many are kings and priests unto God? Amen. God said don't take that off. God says don't take that off. God said, don't tear it, don't rend it. So the Pharisees, in their wisdom, they realized that we have ability to control people and manipulate people. So they made a law that if they had brought somebody before the Sanhedrin and they had charges against somebody, they wanted to really jack them up on the charges, that the high priest could rend his clothes out of emotion, and all the other priests in the Sanhedrins could see it, and they would all vote, yes, he's worthy of death. It was all about emotion. It was, God did not give that law. They added that law. They also added a law that said, if my wife cooks a bad meal, I can divorce her and marry that young girl I'm looking at right now. They added that to that. And so when Jesus came, he said, I don't even recognize you guys. So do you remember when they brought Jesus to trial before Caiaphas? What did God tell Aaron? Don't you rend your vestige. Don't you rend your priestly garments. If you do, you will die. I just read it to you, right? But you remember when they brought Jesus before the trial of the Sanhedrin, and they brought in witnesses, and they couldn't corroborate each other, and this guy contradicted this guy, and they finally brought in two witnesses, and one, they contradicted each other, and finally one guy said, well, he's going to tear the temple down, and said he could rebuild it in three days. And Caiaphas says to Jesus, he said, aren't you going to say anything? Then Caiaphas pulled a trick out of the bag, and he said this as high priest of Israel. And he said, I adjure you by the name of the Lord God of Israel, are you the Son of God? Now when Jesus heard that, Jesus knew that was in the law. That if the high priest was in a hearing and he adjured you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, and what he said, I'm commanding you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, you had to speak up. You had to. That was the law. Jesus didn't come to break the law. So when Pilate threw that at Jesus, Jesus had to say, yes, I am. Yes, I am. And what does the Bible say Pilate did? He grabbed his vestige and he tore it and read, read scripture. As soon as he did that, he said, he deserves crucifixion. And the Bible said, and they all said, yes, crucify him. And they had their moment of emotion. But what Pilate, excuse me, what Caiaphas did not understand is he had given up the priesthood of Israel. And he had abandoned his priesthood. And now Israel had no priests. 
Israel had no high priest. Oh my God, this is so exciting. I can't believe the devil's this stupid. <laughs> Crucify him. And now the priesthood, the high priesthood of Israel is open and it's vacant. And the next one that offers holy blood on the mercy seat of God is the high priest unto God forever and ever and ever. Caiaphas, wow. <laughs> Bless your heart, as my daddy would say. He gave up the priesthood. He abandoned it. It was open. It was vacant to the next man worthy. The next man worthy. And Jesus said, I'll take it. Jesus didn't steal the priesthood. He revived the priesthood. But he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And he said, it's going to be a much better priesthood. And what Jesus did, he restored the Melchizedek priesthood back to the earth and back to heaven. That's what he did. Amen. Jesus could not take it until a man gave it up. And Caiaphas gave it up right there. What did God tell Aaron? Don't you dare tear that vestige of the priesthood. Ooh, that gets me excited because now Jesus is legal. He's the legal priest of the universe. Caiaphas disqualified himself. He abandoned it. My goodness. Every say, but God. God was, God, he, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. God's like, okay, the plan is on. So I want to ask you, when do we celebrate Passover? When do we celebrate Passover? Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday. That's Passover. Amen. That's Passover. When we were younger, we called it Easter. I call it Resurrection Sunday because I don't believe in Easter. I believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was the only time the sacrificial Passover lamb was slain was at Passover. And every family had to have a lamb. Do you remember in the Old Testament it said a lamb for a household? Yes. Say with me, a lamb for a household. A lamb for a household. And the high priest of Israel, he would take a lamb. It was called the lamb, it was the national lamb for Israel, and he would slay the lamb. But that blood of that lamb never went into the Holy of Holies. No, it did not. No, it did not. Because the high priest of Israel could go into the Holy of Holies one time a year. How many know your Bible? Agree with me. One time a year, that's what your Bible says. And that was at Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement in October. We're on to something. The Passover lamb, and the blood of the Passover lamb, never made it to the mercy seat in the temple. Am I right, girl? Whoa! I just blew your mind. Because it blew my mind when I studied this and realized this. So now you understand the blood of bulls and goats talking over here. There was no blood of a lamb in the Holy of Holies. Not the blood of a lamb. It was the blood of bulls and goats. Hallelujah. So Passover is at Resurrection Sunday. You call Some call it Easter. That's in April. Feast that God had for the days of the atonement, that's in October, Yom Kippur. That's the time the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. That's the time he went in. So guys, if you'll get that up there. When Jesus was meeting with his disciples as he was getting ready to be crucified, he had a meeting with them and he said, we're going to go celebrate Passover. And in the meeting of that, he, said that he told him, get the lamb. And the reason that the Passover lamb was so important is, it is the Passover lamb that brought redemption to Israel out of Egypt, right? It is the blood of the Passover lamb that brings redemption and liberation to you out of the world. Yes. That's the blood of the lamb that God told Israel, you put on the doorpost and the lintel. And God said, every house has to do that. So I'll just put it this way. 
My daddy told me, you're not going to get to heaven on my coattail, son. You're going to have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Find out who he is. Find out his word says. Find out what his blood is. And you're going to have to find out. You're going to have to have a personal. You're going to have to sacrifice the lamb for yourself and your house, son. You can't get to heaven on my coattails. You can't get to heaven on your daddy's coattails, or your uncle's coattails, or your husband's coattails, your wife's coattails. You can't get to Jesus except you come by yourself. So everybody in Israel, every family had to sacrifice a lamb. So when Jesus said, we're going to celebrate Passover, the disciples knew exactly what he was talking about. But then Jesus changes his up. And it says, we're eating Jesus, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. What do you mean? We're eating the lamb. I can imagine the confusion. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, drink ye all of it for it. And here it is. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the many for the remission. Everybody say remission. remission. Oh, Jesus is saying something different. I, I can just imagine Peter and John. What, what's he talking about? We, we celebrated Passover 1,600 years. And now he's saying he's the Passover. He, he's saying he's the Passover lamb. He, he said we got to eat his blood and drink his, eat his flesh and drink his blood. What is going on here? What Jesus is saying is something better is coming. Something better is returning. Something better is on the way. So Jesus offers the sacrifice at Passover with the disciples and initiates something we call what? Communion. And Jesus said, this is the new thing I'm doing. I'm restoring. I'm restoring the order of Melchizedek in the earth. This is why Christ's priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, it's better than the priesthood of Aaron. It's why Christ's priesthood is the, after the order of Melchizedek and better than any priesthood of man could ever be. Since Jesus was victorious over death, he lives forever and has a permanent priesthood. Nobody can replace him. He'll never die. There's no, nobody coming after him. He is high priest unto God forever living to make intercession for you and I. Nobody can take his place. Nobody can take him down. Nobody can kick him off the throne. That's what makes him the order after Melchizedek. And so he doesn't have legal requirements concerning bodily descent by the power of indestructible life. He has witnessed of him that he is the priest forever in his indestructible life. So it is the priesthood of heaven. The priesthood of men covered sin. The priesthood of heaven removed sin. Hallelujah. So in the Old Testament, what happened on the Day of Atonement? Do you know on the Day of Atonement, the priest went into the Holy of Holies three times? Three times. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies three times. Do we got that up there, guys? Maybe I don't know what where my stick went, but somebody always takes that stick. So as we look at the Old Testament tabernacle, really what it what it talks is represents Jesus Christ. That's all this represents. So here we have the outer court, we have the brazen altar, the brazen labor. Here we have the inner court, we have the lampstand, we have the table of showbread, we have the altar of incense. Here we have the veil and we have the Holy of Holies. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, right? So the way is through the blood. That's the sacrificial altar. That's where the animals were sacrificed. Say, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the, way. the labor represents what? The truth, which the truth is the word of God. Washing by the water of the word. So he's the truth. And the life is in the power of this represents the Holy Spirit. So Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And that's how you get to God the Father and the Holy of Holies. Right there, that's how you do it. Hallelujah. Amen. So how can you miss that? You've got to want to miss it to miss that. So on the Day of Atonement, the ritual began with the priest. He'd offer the daily morning sacrifices and, and those sacrifices so that he could go... And he could come into the holy place, and he would offer uh, prayers at the altar of incense. He would not go into the holy of holies yet. He would wash and change his clothes in this process five times. By the washing of the water with the word. By the washing of the water with the word. Say it with me. By the washing of the water with the word. So the robes were right. Excuse me, completely white. 
He had all his vestiges of uh, his priestly garments taken off other than the white robe. And I believe that represents Christ taking off his, humanity, uh, taking off his deity and becoming humanity. And doing what he did as a man. Next, a high priest would bring two goats into the tabernacle or temple and cast lots for each of them. One was for his L or the scapegoat, or which I call the escape goat, and the other was for the Lord. And a red ribbon was tied around the horns of the scapegoat to distinguish it from the goat dedicated to the Lord. And the high priest would take a bullock. This is the Day of Atonement. A young bull and place his hands on its head, symbolically transferring his sin and the sins of the fellow priest to the bull. He would then slay the throat, bull by the throat and catch the blood in a dish to be saved for later services. He then would bring and go here and he would take coals from here and incense and he would go into the Holy of Holies and he would take that incense with him and coals from the altar here, the brazen altar, and he would light incense in the holy place. So he would come here, the first thing he'd do is he'd light incense, and it would fill the room with the incense and the smoke. And that represents the Shekinah glory of God. And what that means is where God is, his glory is there. So that was number one. Say, that was the first time he went in. And then he would come back out. He's dressed all in white. The room would fill with smoke, and the smoke would actually billow out the top, and the people would know that the priest has now lit the incense before the Lord, and that the process can continue. Do you know the problem was, if you goofed up as a priest in this process, you had to start over? But if you goofed up in the Holy of Holies, you died. I don't want that job. <laughs> The high priest would then exit the Holy of Holies, wash again, washing with the water word, take the blood of a bull, of the bull, and re-enter the Holy of Holies for a second time. He would then sprinkle seven times the blood of the bull on the Ark of the Covenant. And now we know what they're talking about in Hebrews where he talks about the sprinkling of blood. He didn't pour it on, he sprinkled the blood. The Bible says that Moses, he sprinkled the blood on the people. I sprinkle the blood on you every day. You can sprinkle the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on yourself every day. And he would come and he would sprinkle the blood the second time. And then he would sprinkle seven times the blood on the bull on the Ark of the Covenant. Seven times, which what is means the number of perfection, the number of completion. It is finished. <laughs> the number of completion. The shedding of the young bull represented that the high priest was forgiven. And now he was reconciled to enter back in for the people. So the high priest would then kill the goat that was chosen of the Lord. And every bit of this is in Leviticus 16. You can read every bit of it. And he would slay the goat, saving the blood in addition. He would enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of the goat. This is the final time. And he did before. He would sprinkle the blood of the goat seven times before the ark. And this was, this was the but sacrifice for the people of Israel. So he needed a sacrifice for himself, and then he had to have a sacrifice for the people. How many times did Jesus enter the holy place? Once. How many times? One of important, the most important scriptures you've ever read. So he sprinkled it seven times, and the goat was the offering for the people. And this was the act of bringing the blood of the holy lamb excuse me, blood of, the, blood of the Holy One, representing that all Israel was symbolically able to enter the presence of God through a high priest. Now Israel had access to God through their high priest. I wonder where else we read that. Where else do we have access to God through a high priest? Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ himself. Hebrews 9.11, but Christ being come and high priest, whoo, there it is, of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle made not with hands, that is to say not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, neither by, he said, I know what the Old Testament, I know what the priest did in the Old Testament. They brought in the blood of bulls and goats into the Holy of Holies. The lamb was sacrificed at Passover, brothers and sisters, and nobody went into the Holy of Holies at Passover. 
Say, but God. <laughs> Paul says it's neither by the blood of goats or calves or bulls, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. No mention of a lamb here. In heaven, the only blood that ever hit the mercy seat of heaven is the blood of the Lamb of God. In heaven, the only blood that has hit the mercy seat is the blood of the Lamb of God. Not of bulls, not of goats. Do you understand what I just told you? The only blood that Jesus took to heaven was his own precious blood, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is the only blood. God said, I'm not going to mingle the blood of my precious Son, the Holy Lamb of God, with the blood of bulls and goats. It'll never happen. And God said, it won't let it happen on earth, and it'll never happen in heaven. The only blood in heaven that is sacrificial and is efficacious and strong and powerful for you is not blood of goats, it's not blood of bulls or doves or anything else. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's efficacious, it's powerful, it's redemptive, and it will never lose its power. And then when it speaks, God listens. Amen. You think people listen to E.F. Hutton, you ought to hear what happens in heaven when blood speaks for you. God said, I'm not going to let what happen, happen on earth, what I'm not going to let happen in heaven. Right? right. right? Yes. I'm not going to let the blood of a lamb go on the mercy seat on the earth. And I'm not going to let the excuse, blood of bulls and goats uh, of the lamb. I'm not going to let the blood of bulls and goats on, on the mercy seat of heaven. Right. And that's why Jesus Christ was crucified at Passover. Mm. Wow. And not on the Day of Atonement. God said, I only need one, one blood. I only need the blood of the, the perfect, holy, pure blood of Jesus Christ. That's all I need. And God said, this cancels all that bull and goat and all that sacrifice. Aren't you glad we don't have to do sacrifice rituals every day, every year? Come to church with your lamb. My goodness. Half of you to eat it for you got him here anyway. Think about that. What, what? He went in once and for all. But hold it. He went in once and for all. The priest had to bring a sacrifice for himself. But Jesus Christ was the priest and the lamb. He was the offerer and the offering. He was the offerer and the offering. He only needed to go in one time. He, he didn't need to be purified for himself. He didn't need purified by his blood. He was holy, saltless, and spotless, and sinless by the name of God. He didn't need to go in twice or three times. God said, all you need is one time because you're the offering and the offerer. You are the priest and you are the lamb, my God Almighty. God said, one time will do it. He didn't need three times. He is the priest and the lamb. He is the offering and the offerer. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All this time God was looking for just one bit of blood. Remember I told you blood returns to its source? Last week I told you that Jesus Christ was born of Mary, a virgin. That he is the promise of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. The prophecy that the seed of the woman would destroy the enemy. Everybody say the seed of the woman. Yeah. So if it's the seed of the woman and something is implanted, who's the father? Who was Jesus' father? God the Father. When Jesus was baptized, what happened? A voice came out of saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hey, devil, we just told you who the Father is. The Father is God the Father, so the blood had the DNA of God Himself and the DNA of heaven, and it was perfect and holy, and that's why it's so powerful. It has the blood of God. Because God is the Father. My goodness. Now I know why the devil hates the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I know why demons hate it. This, this, this is the blood of heaven. This blood has the DNA of God. That's how I can remove every stain out of your life. That's how I can heal your body. It's the DNA of heaven. So now, 
we have access because of a great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we too have to go to God through our great high priest. I praise God Jesus only entered once. It defined him as who he was, the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world, the great high priest and the Lamb of God. He didn't need to go in twice. He's the offerer and the offering. Say, he's the offerer, the offerer. and the offering. the offering. And God said, I'm not going to mix the blood, precious blood of heaven with the blood of bulls and goats on this, offer, on this altar. God said, when I look there, I'm going to see blood that is so efficacious and so powerful and so holy and so anointed, nothing can touch it. So whatever you think you've done, and you think God can't forgive you, i got news for you. The blood of Jesus is more powerful than anything you've done, thought about doing, could do, would do. It's more powerful than that. My goodness. That's blood. It'll always be powerful. I, I understand why he was crucified at Passover. <laughs> He's the Passover lamb. And, and you know how efficient God is? God says, I'm going to wrap up Passover and the Day of Atonement in one great exchange. And when my son goes to the cross, it's going to take care of your Passover situation, your redemption situation. It's going to take care of all your sin issues. And it is going to put you in a place where you now have the ability to have justification, sanctification, gratitude. In the Lord Jesus Christ, you have all these things that now come by the power of the blood. You don't just get salvation. You get re and redemption. You get sanctification. You get redemption. You get the goodness and the glory of God in every area of your life. <laughs> God said, it, it, no, nothing's going to mingle with this blood. The blood of bulls and goats, it's not even close. In Hebrews, Paul says this, But you have come to Mount Zion into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. How many registered in heaven? I don't know about you, but I am registered in heaven. My God Almighty, that's exciting. <laughs> I mean, you could be registered a lot of places, but that's where you really need to be registered. <laughs> and we're registered in heaven, and we're registered to God. That's what it says. We are registered to God. Yes. The judge of all. And to the spirits of just men made perfect through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. To Jesus, the mediator of the new and better covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling. So when Jesus took his blood. Do you remember when he appeared there at the garden and Mary went to touch him? And she said, don't touch me. I, I, he said, I have not yet ascended to the Father. And Jesus, he said, I got to ascend to the Father. What did he have to ascend to the Father for? He had to take the blood. And seven times. Mercy. Grace. Redemption. Healing. My God. He, did, he sprinkled the blood seven times. It was required. And God said, it is now complete. Yes. I don't need any more blood of bulls. And I don't need any more blood of goats. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only blood that's ever been on the mercy seat. I praise God for that. I praise God there's no blood of bulls or goats on his mercy seat. It's the only blood in heaven. That's why it washes, cleans, reinstates, disinfects, removes. And that's why he was crucified on Passover. Not on the Day of Atonement. God said, I'm going to wrap this all up in one incredible Incredible sacrifice. So now you know why Hebrew says the blood of bulls and goats. What Paul was saying is that really never did work. It, all it did was cover sin. It never removed sin. That's what he's saying there. He said it never removed sin. It just covered it. I want blood that removes sin. So as we look here in the earthly tabernacle that God gave Moses... The blood of a lamb never touched that mercy seat. I'm telling you the truth. Get your Bible. We'll read the book of Leviticus. But the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ did touch the mercy seat in heaven. This is just a pattern of what's in heaven. So now because of that, you're eternal unto God. Your name's in the Lamb's book of life. Happy are the people whose gods are the Lord. Why don't we start living like it, acting like it, talking like it, preaching like it, believing like it, telling our neighbors, telling our friends, telling the world. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about you? spotless, sinless, holy blood. 
that return to its source. That return to its source in heaven. Jesus took that blood. He brought it to earth. Had it in his body. Had it shed. He took it back up after he rose from the dead. And he returned it to its source, God the Father. Hallelujah! The blood of Jesus Christ got DNA. You and I, can, we need to understand the power of that DNA. Father, I just pray right now your blessing on this word today. Oh, Jesus, I thank you for the blood. I thank you for the mercy. God, I thank you that you listened to the blood. Now I know why. It's your blood. It's your DNA. It knows who you are. It returned to you. It returned to its source. It returned to the throne of God. Hallelujah. And Father, I just ask for that impartation in each and every one of our hearts today. That the apostle, in, in the writing of the Hebrews, he gets it exactly right. He gets it exactly right. There is nothing more powerful than the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself. His blood can't be touched. It can't be diluted. Father, it can't be stolen. It can't, it cannot be moved. Oh, Jesus, I thank you for that sacrifice today. I thank you for that most holy sacrifice the universe has ever seen. And Father, I thank you that you listen to that blood. So Father, I just pray your blessing on this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. That's what the blood can do. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. That's what the blood can do. The Lord lift his countenance upon you, give you his peace. That's what the blood can do. And God said, if you put my name on your children, I'll seek them. For I'm blood covenant. I'm blood covenant God. That's what the blood of God can do. That's what the blood of God can do. That's what the blood of God can do. If you receive it, say amen. amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Go in the name of the Lord and understand you have blood in heaven that is speaking mercy, grace, healing, power, anointing, goodness, prosperity, health. God bless you. You're dismissed. Hello, one and all. We have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona. 85902. And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. While you're at it, like us on Facebook. Link is in the description. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Link is also in the description. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue. And with that, we wish you a blessed week.